Amy Sherman Palladino and Dan Palladino are the writers, directors, producers, and so much more on the series, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I'm David Buchanan with Gold Derby. Amy, I wanted to start with a question for you, and I wanted to start with the end of the series because I had read that you always kind of had this ending in mind for Midge and, and her journey to culminate, you know, with her big break on television. Um, I just wanted to ask you, what about that way, you know, when you started, you know, I, creating the series, you know, what seemed so perfect about that? And over the course of five seasons, you know, did you ever have other ideas? Did you ever waver from that? Or was that always kind of the, you know, the kind of gold standard ending for you? Uh, I've never had an idea ever over the entire five, five seasons. No, I'm just kidding. Um, well, no, it was actually part, it was part of the pitch. Like it, the, the pitch was, you know, the journey from a, a Upper West Side uh, queen of six blocks, uh, house housewife to uh, Johnny Carson's couch. And we did our own Johnny Carson because Johnny Carson wasn't quite Johnny Carson when we in our time frame, he was a little later, but uh, that was always sort of the trajectory because the fun is the struggle, you know, from there it's rehab. And so we, you know, we figured that's been covered, but- um, Struggle, 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 make it rehab. But boom, yep. yeah, it's a very simple line. Yep. Um, but it was always, that was always the idea. And we, you know, we we talked about, we didn't know how many seasons or how many episodes it was till we got there but we always that was sort of our our push forward and our trajectory and always like when we when we felt like every season we wanted her world to expand to expand to expand to expand till right that point where she like shot off like a rocket it makes great sense and what i love about the season too is that even though that's where the story really culminates we get so many great flash forwards and i love that they're kind of interspersed and so integral to the season so that you know, it's not just tacked on in the finale, a kind of, you know, a scene. We get a real idea of where all these characters end up. Um, and Dan, I wanted to ask you a question about that in particular, because one of the great episodes of the season is the Testarostial, um, which you wrote and directed. Just talk about the structure of that episode. I think it's so ingenious how, you know, we get kind of the public tributes and then the kind of private discussion and all these scenes. Um, so the inspiration for that and also as you were kind of crafting that episode, what did you learn about Susie that maybe surprised you as you were writing it? It's something that came out that, you know, maybe you, you know, were surprised to learn about her. The episode, it was one of those things that very, very early in talking about season five, we thought, oh, there's got to be a roast of Susie Meyerson in the future. And it'll be a great way to show where she is at that time in the future and also show her past, which is still future for our audience, but show her past um, because there was so much to mine with Susie. Um, we always, I mean, we discovered, I think, more about the Susie character, especially in season five, than almost any other characters because there was so much mystery about her. Yeah, we kept her mysterious. For... Yeah, I mean, we really didn't know. I mean, and I'm saying not just the audience didn't know, but Amy and I didn't know what Susie did between the time that she maybe went to college and 16 years later when, when she met Mitch. Um, maybe she was at the gaslight that whole time. Maybe she was traveling around. Uh, she was sort of like Jesus Christ in that way. There was wow. a big gap of wow. not knowing. Okay. Um, so she was, so it was, there was a lot of things to discover about her. I think the style is just, um, it's it's just a it's kind of another natural aspect of what I like to do, and Amy was kind enough to let me indulge it. It was I'll I'll say I never went into directing an episode with more trepidation than I did with that one because if that one was not going to work, it was going to be like a grand failure that was going to be very very difficult to to clean up. There were a lot of out, outside speaking roles. I needed great people. I think I I found great people. I went back to some old favorites like Sean Gunn and Danny Strong and people that I've worked with and are, and I'm friends with. And uh, it was a lot of voiceover. And I'll confess, I watched uh, Casino a lot, Scorsese's <laughs> Casino, because there's a lot of voiceover in, in in Casino. And there's a lot of like, and, and De Niro and Harvey Keitel are kind of masters at making that stuff sound naturalistic. So I did my best to sort of 
keep that voiceover as natural as possible. And um, yeah, it was a little bit like a Chinese puzzle putting it together, but I was really happy with the way it worked out. It was a it was a true testament to our friendship with Alex Borstein because when she got the script and she saw how many pages she was on, <laughs> she almost killed us. It was almost it was it was a, it was a little brutal. It's but, not the um, first time Alex has almost killed us. She's, she's like been yeah, trying for twenty yeah. years. But uh, she's amazing, and and it was also fun to like let her sort of take over for a while. It was it's she was fantastic. Yeah, her range in that episode is just incredible because we have that really devastating fight scene between Susie and Midge, yeah. and then that beautiful kind of reconciliation by by video, which is just a beautiful moment. Um, speaking of also beautiful moments for for the ensemble, I wanted to ask you both about Tony Shalhoub this season because that scene that he has, where he kind of realizes how he's treated Midge over the course of her lifetime and his own kind of gender biases is such a beautiful moment. It's shot so well. Obviously, Tony performs it, you know, impeccably. Just wanted to ask you, how important was it for you both to kind of explore that facet of Abe's character, you know, before the series signed off? Because it really felt like a beautiful culmination of um, an arc and a journey he's been on, you know, since the very first episode. Well, everybody, you know, our, our whole concept from the very beginning was this thing that happens with Midge blew everybody's life up. And and blew everyone off the trajectory that they were that they were they they were on their life trajectory. So, you know, one of our big things when we when we realized well it's season five and we've got to bring all these characters that we love so much to some sort of some sort of conclusion and give the, some sort of like natural like to their story. You know, it was always talked about that Abe was the one at the very beginning that had the least amount of a relationship with his daughter. His relationship was with his son. And Rose and Midge were basically best friends because Midge is like, that's the life I want. I want the same life. We're in the same building. You know, I'm we're, we're wearing the same clothes. We talk about our children in the same way. And once this thing happened, it turned out that Midge was actually a lot more like, like Abe than Rose and and to have Abe start to realize that and have Abe be the one, you know, it wasn't until the very last episode that Rose could even watch Midge do stand up. She just, she, she could never bring herself to even do it, you know? So it was always like that thing with him was for them to like know at some point, even if it wasn't like in a moment where they're staring at each other going, I'm like you and you're like me, it's that, he never saw that the daughter was the person that he was the most aligned with and the most like him and the most sort of impulsive, you know, they're both incredibly impulsive. She blew up her life and Abe blew up their life. It was, it, it was just sort of that kind of natural, beautiful end. And with that amazing, the amazing scene and the way Tony did it was just, it was everything we could have hoped for. And Dan watched another movie a long time. <laughs> he was writing that one. Also, we watched a lot of movies. We watched so many movies. It's weird that we got had time we're, to like shooting. Weirdly, movies. that one was Pippi Longstocking. Yeah, it was that inspired was by Pippi Longstocking. Kind of Swedish reference. You don't see a direct strange. line, but I could well, yeah. on a longer broadcast. I could show you a direct line from Pippi to that scene. Offline, we'll, we'll pick that up offline. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I must, I must oh. see it. Um, I really want to dive into the the finale in detail, which I thought was just an impeccable kind of end to the series. Um, and specifically, I wanted to talk about Midge's monologue when she does kind of grab those four minutes, she takes a chance, it works out exactly as, as she had hoped. Um, I wanted to ask you, Amy, about shooting that because I feel like there's such restraint in, in how you shoot those moments. And then there's that beautiful kind of flourish of the 360, you know, I don't know if it's a dolly shot, but that shot around Midge with the lighting, it's just, like one of the most evocative moments of the season of the series finale. And I think is just the perfect kind of touch to it. So just talk us through, you know, how you envisioned that monologue when you wrote it, what it looked like on the page and then getting it on its feet in that way. Well, first of all, it was a, it was a steady cam shot. It was our beloved Jim McConkey, who is just a genius and, you know, our, our lives wouldn't exist without him. Um, but you know, it was, it was, it, it, it's one of those things where like you spend five years going and they're going to be the biggest star in the world or they're the greatest painter in the world or they're the most, and then suddenly you're like, and now prove it. So it, it was a very tricky 
tricky monologue. I and mean, we have we had great we have a great staff of um, uh, comedy writers that keep us honest uh, in the room. And and basically we followed it like we followed anything else, which was you know I wrote out the emotional arc of the monologue, and then of course because this monologue was so important, there was constant like rewriting and cutting and changing and honing and honing and honing and really making sure that it was so clear and so of the moment and it had to sum up her entire world philosophy and yet couldn't be something she'd already said before and she's hit on a lot of like feminist points before and men and women and the difference between men and women and it really honed in on her and her ambition and her and the fact that like she is somebody much like uh, the director of the Testarossio who like it's go big or go home like it's it's either going to work or it's not going to work but either way she's either going to fail on a cataclysmic scale or she's going to go through the roof and be the biggest star in the world so it was it was a lot of you know um working with Rachel a lot of rehearsal on that a lot of honing it down a lot of Rachel coming back when I handed her new pages and saying oh I missed that that hook, that one joke, if you could just give me that joke, because Rachel, it has to put it together as an actress and then put the butt on bumps in. So it was a it was a lot of back and forth on that. And it was tricky because you wanted it to sort of feel like it was the journey of her career and the journey of her five years. And you wanted to remind everybody where she started and where she came from. So you were almost a little bit in her head. And we were in the studio with bright lights. And uh, you know, when you when you would come on and do stand up in a studio like that, there was no microphone, there was no so we we added in like little elements. And then um David Mullen, um, Professor Mullen, who knows everything about everything, our, our DP and just a genius, you know, we talked a lot about I, I said, I really want a moment that takes us back to the gaslight, but it's gotta be so. I subtle, I almost don't want people to know that it's happening till they're in it and maybe not until they're almost out of it. So it was a lot of talks. We rehearsed it a lot, what the level, the timing, when it would be. Um, and it seems, you know, like so much work went into a moment that turned out to be like, you know, like literally like the, this kind of moment for like a huge hour long show. But it everything had to be right. And the sounds, like once we got into the sound mix, um, Ron Boshar, wonderful sound guy, he brought old gaslight sound effects in. So we had the clinkling of the glasses and the 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 coughs and the the feel and the audiences and a little bit of the vibe and the sound of the room that sort of took over and everything sort of shifted for a minute in and out. And it was it was a lot of coordination, but it, it, and a lot of people like really <laughs> obsessing about it and a lot of rehearsal um, and Rachel, God love her, you know, the, the commitment that she has to any monologue, even one that's just about, you know, I'm on a boat and you guys are salesmen and I'm going to do some dick jokes. You know, it doesn't matter. Like for her, like it's over and over and it's work it and work it and work it. And this one was just like, it was, it was quite it was quite pressure filled for this young lady who had to like bring it all home in that moment. So uh, Boy, I, I've got to see this episode. It's, it's very good. Great. It's very good. I got to I got to catch up. I'm I'm still on episode three, so I got to. I also hijacked the whole uh, cast because I made them all sit in the audience for it because selfishly, I really wanted us to end the last night. I wanted us all to be together. And um, it was emotional. It was, it was very so emotional. emotional. And we like I discussed with Rachel what the last moment is she wanted to shoot, like with what her last line wanted to be. Like it was very, it was all very planned so that we could all have a nervous breakdown at three o'clock in the morning on a sound stage and drink cheap champagne and then go home and call our therapist. You have to imagine if that was you know the last few days hearing you know Reed Scott utter the title of the series in the series just must have been an incredible moment for the ensemble members in the audience who were just observing because they weren't on camera. And for the two of you, just a beautiful, beautiful moment. Um, we also get another scene, which is really wonderful, that kind of ending scene of Susie and Midge, you know, many, many years in the future together, 
um, you know, t together on the phone watching Jeopardy, just a really simple kind of everyday, beautiful scene of friendship. Dan, what, what did you want the audience to take away from that kind of final scene that we get? You know, because you could have left it, you know, with that moment of triumph at the J Gordon Ford show, but bringing it down to a really lovely kind of intimate moment was was so clever. We wanted to, you know, we always knew from the beginning that if, if there's one true love story in this series, it was the love between Susie and Midge. Um, we broke them up, as some couples do. <laughs> Um, we they showed, had a cute meet. Yeah, they had a cute meet, and we sh and we sh and we showed the ups and downs of a friendship of a, of two very very flawed women. I mean, certainly Susie was flawed. Midge had her flaws too, and they were both stubborn women. They were both strong women, um, but they were forged together. They were an odd couple, um, just sort of forged together. And we wanted to end on, we wanted to show the audience sort of the loneliness of that this business can be, especially for someone like Midge Maisel, um, who can be surrounded by staff, but still sort of be living alone, not unhappily, but certainly we, she didn't look joyous in those last, in those last shots. We want to show two women that were successful, that, that achieved everything yeah. financially that they wanted to achieve. And, and, we, and could not have achieved it separately. Yeah. And like needed each other to, them to do together it. They did it. And then we wanted to show that at the very end, it really was just the true, the one thing they could each count on is the friendship and love of the other. And that's, that, that was always the way we were going to end it. There's a lot of, we got a piece of fan mail from someone who wrote, in the middle of the airing of the episodes and wrote, you you broke up Susie and Midge. How heartless of you. I'll never watch the rest of the, uh, and I, I felt like writing back and saying, please watch to the end. It's coming, just hang on. This is a temporary schism. But yeah, that was that was really the true. We saw it, we saw it the day that like Rachel and Alex Borstein, who I, we had known for a long, long time, read together in the initial audition. We, we those two bonded in a way they're very different so different men. so very weirdly different. different and and they just they they weirdly bonded and so that that bond and that friendship was there personally between them and it was just it was just our goal then to show that show that bond all throughout and to show it all the way to the end of their lives before i let you go i have to ask a really impossible question which is over the five seasons you, you both directed so many episodes do you have a favorite shot of yours or of each other's that when you think back on all the tremendous work that you've done, it really stands out as a moment you're particularly proud of behind the camera? Oh boy. Uh, the USO shot was very hard. Yeah, that was a biggie. And I kept making it harder because that's all I do is, is, is make everyone's life completely miserable. That's why I was put on this earth. So like, I, I'm I'm actually very I'm very proud we all pulled that off because it 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 was so like uh, can we <laughs> are we gonna make it I would say that and Cuba those were the the Cuba Club um, that was another one but um, yeah I can't I can't think of a one or but I was really happy when I did I think it was the season two it was the season two episode where you started in the in the uh, in the stage deli and they found out that a te that a telethon was was happening and you saw Susie bouncing around. I really liked that, but also just uh, the the test of Rosio for me was just it was seventy eight scenes over eighty pages. It was almost like one, it was almost like one. It was just one quick shot after another and putting it together was really hard, but I was really happy with the ending of it. And the house, your house, I loved your house thing in the- uh, Oh, and- The yeah, Catskills, I, and, that, and that house- thing And weirdly the house thing where they're moving in, where, per perversely for us was just one locked camera on this group and rehearsing that over and over again of them coming the timing, in, though, the cleaning thing. up. Yeah, we that that one was that one was a nice one, and it didn't move, and it, it and nothing. nothing yeah, moved. yeah, yeah. I yeah. really, yeah. Thank you, thank you, dear. It's nice of you to point. Oh out. no, I love that. It's so great. you've seen the show. I, I have seen, seen the show. show. Okay. I know. Well, one of us should have seen it. Yeah. So at this point, but those are great. I, I feel like I've walked down memory lane now, kind of envisioning all the all the wonderful scenes you pulled out. Congratulations, Amy and Dan, on five wonderful seasons of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Thank you so much for talking to Gold Derby today. Thank Absolutely, you. it was Thank great you talking, talking to you. To us.